Hello, and welcome to Books and Beyond. I'm your host, Jim Bennett, Jimmy Bennett, and uh, I, first of all, I want to hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas and a great holiday. Uh, we still got New Year's coming up, so uh, save a little for that. Um, I, uh, you know, on my show here, Books and Beyond, I like to uh, bring people that uh, have other careers, other lives, do other things, but then they have a creative side to themselves, such as novelists, artists, painters, uh, comedians, musicians. Um, I like to bring them out and uh, let people show, you know, another side of themselves. Um, today, I have a very special guest, uh, Len Matteo, but Botano. Matano. Len Matano, um, who I met through CAPA, the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, and uh, was actually featured in this month's uh, Mystic Neighbors. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Saadi did a nice story on him. Welcome, Len. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very All much. Right. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Oh, sure. So um, first, my wife and I moved here with our daughters um, in 20, 2009, oh, okay. end of 2009. And we've lived for our entire year, uh, our entire lives in Michigan uh, for about 18 years in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, had previously lived there uh, in Kalamazoo uh, when my wife and I met at Kalamazoo College. Ah. Then we had a 10-year segue in uh, Ann Arbor where we both went to the University of Michigan and did our graduate training. I did medical school and she had her PhD. Then we uh, had job opportunities in Kalamazoo so we moved there. So it was very nice. We enjoyed living there. Um, and while I was there, I'm a pediatric oncologist by training. Uh, I was involved in um, a, uh, a program there that I was actually brought to Kalamazoo to develop an academic pediatric oncology clinic uh, but we also were very involved in clinical research, um, education, um, and uh, a lot of volunteer activity. So I did that for 18 years. Then we had an opportunity to move here. Um, my wife uh, had a job transfer through the pharmaceutical industry. And just about that time, uh, a lot of the um, individualized therapies were coming of age. Um, and I thought, gee, you know, there many investigations for those drugs in um, adult cancers, uh, but there are 20% of children who are diagnosed with cancer who don't survive, um, ultimately, um, and wouldn't it be great if we can start harnessing that power and direct it towards pediatric oncology. So I also joined um, the pharmaceutical industry, worked there for a little over two years full-time, and since then have been doing consulting in drug development. I'm continuing my clinical research which is primarily in childhood leukemias, uh, both for therapy and for side effects. So wow, we've been here. So That is, uh, and you've done a lot of volunteer work for raising money too, right? Uh, um, for raising money, uh, but also um, primarily uh, through the American Cancer Society and a few other institutions I want to mention, specifically St. Baldrick's uh, Foundation, which is very active in fundraising to help underwrite um, some of the uh, research that is ongoing in addition to the funding that's done through the National Cancer Institute, uh, you know, government sponsored programs. Um, but uh, there's a vast network, which is a, a wonderful thing to um, really synergize in terms of the numbers of patients, relatively few. They add up to a lot when you look at the numbers of children and families that are affected by cancer. Um, but it's um, the power of working together in institutions to be able to really make strides in outcome. So both on the clinical investigation side of things during academics, uh, but then also in pharmaceutical, helping to look at new drugs and seeing how we might be able to apply them to childhood cancer, improving outcomes and lessening the side effects. And we're making real progress, so, so that's good. good. Well, that's a, that was going to be my next question. I mm -hmm. was going to ask you how we're doing yeah. with that. And I hope that everybody out there will you know, maybe consider helping out, donating. Um, it's an important thing. And it's, it's, you know, saving our children is, should be one of our biggest concerns. It you know? is. You know, every life that's affected by cancer, whether it's a child or an adult, or by any life-threatening um, disease uh, that shortens their, their life or affects their life in a, in right. a meaningful way, um, is important and worthwhile, and, and we need to make strides in that. You know, in my field with pediatrics, um, it's, very, it's very poignant. Um, it affects the patient, the child. Um, the family, uh, children, uh, other children in the family, the parents, grandparents, 
and uh, neighborhoods, et cetera. So um, it's, it's a, an important field. Uh, but if you look over the last 50 years, um, going from 10% um, short and long-term survival now to about 80% of children being cured. That's fantastic. So that's good. But, you know, 80% cured implies 20% not cured. Right. And so um, it's still just as devastating now for each child or patient um, who doesn't have long-term survival in their future. Right. Uh, that we make every effort we can to make progress. Yes, uh, this is one fight that we really do need to win. Mm -hmm. um, so, bit by bit. Yep. We are doing it. So, um, how did now? How did you? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're very busy. You know, it's a very intense field. How did you? Uh, what, what what inspired you to? Uh, you know, write a book. Mm -hmm. You know, to to uh, branch out and try something yeah, on that else. Side, yeah. So I've always been interested in writing uh, and creatively, and I had never done anything formally, but uh, going back to high school and college, right. uh, working with that, um, and then just the natural career uh, for the different areas um, that I was responsible for over the course of years. Uh, I was called on to do a lot of writing in different capacities, different venues. Um, and so um, when I uh, made the transition from uh, being a full-time pharmaceutical worker, to being a consultant, um, I was able to you know, have a little bit of extra time, carve out time, um, and I never really intended to, you know, I never had in, in my, um, in my um, bucket list to write a novel, uh, but one morning I, I had the inspiration for this novel and, and I felt it needed to be written. So you hear yeah. that commonly from writers, but um, it really was the case, and what I found was that um, all components of my background and, and skills that you develop over the course of time, plus your you know, God-given talents. Um, it, sometimes you're blessed with the opportunity to pull all of those together. Um, and so I'm, I'm pleased. I think at my age, I'm not retirement age, uh, but to be able to uh, segue to something a little bit different and to bring um, new things for, for the world to take a look at. Right. And to consider this from different perspectives, yep. be it from um, childhood cancer or just the, the family drama that surrounds that kind of a, uh, of a situation, but also how people cope. And I think the real, uh, the mission of the story, if I can put it that way, is to um, confront the universal um, issue that we all have, which is we're all mortal and yet we live our lives and we have to you know, make something of that. How do we reconcile those two things? Um, for some people, there are transcendent powers um, that we rely on and, and find sustenance and meaning in our lives uh, in the transcendent, um, i.e. God. Um, and others, um, they, they find meaning in what they do. So um, I think folks reading this particular book um, can approach that from whatever their personal perspective is. But I think um, in any book that you read, whether it's a history book or whether it's a, a political book, um, you uh, hope to expand your um, understanding of, of things in the world. Um, if I read a history book about the Holocaust, um, I'm not of Jewish faith, but man, am I affected by yeah. that. And, and so um, I think um, some books are just meant for a broad audience and, and everyone can um, be moved by stories and, and learn something and empathy, if nothing else. And, and maybe it resonates specifically with you, um, but in any case, it would be something that um, is a benefit to people. So. I, you know, I, that's, that's a great point. Um, I do, I feel the same way. Um, uh, any book that you read can give you a different point of view, a different mm -hmm. perspective about things, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, it broadens your mind. It broadens, it opens up a lot of possibilities mm -hmm. um, of the way things can be or how somebody else sees them, you might have a rigid set of views about certain things, and then mm -hmm. you read and you go, well, maybe there is another side of this. Right. Um, one of the things that uh, that fascinates you about your book and, and your story is um, you have a good, strong faith, mm -hmm. and how you have melded that faith in with your science. Um, how, how, does that, how does that work with you? How, how do you... How do you reconcile the one with the other? I'm mm -hmm. just saying, you know, there's some people that get, you know, all 
science, science, God, God. Right. You know what I mean? When I, I do believe that there's, there's a melding of the two, but how did you, how does that resonate with you? How do you meld those uh, beliefs? Yeah, I, th I think they, the two interact very strongly. Um, for those who um, don't have a faith outside of the physical world, um, they um, can look and seek um, information about the physical world and have an understanding of things, how they work based in science. Um, and that um, I share, absolutely, because science, uh, proven science, uh, scientific inquiry, hypotheses and proof of hypotheses, uh, is all very important and we make and live in a physical world. Um, but um, I think most people have a sense that there is something outside of the physical world and that could be something in, in terms of spiritual um, realm. Uh, but even some simple things such as philosophy or um, beauty or goodness, um, those are not necessarily subjects or topics uh, that can lend themselves easily to scientific um, analysis. And so I think um, when we think about it, science has a very important uh, role in our lives, and I'm a scientist, clinical scientist. Um, but um, I think people have a natural understanding that there are many subjects outside of that. How do you explain love? Right. You can investigate it from a sociologic perspective, from a theologic perspective, um, but very soon you get to issues that are not uh, within the realm of a scientific observation. Um, and so um, I, I think it all just dovetails. Now, how you uh, see that and perceive that, I think has a lot to do with the tradition in your homes, uh, how you've been raised, what you've been exposed to, and where you're at in life, what the challenges have been, um, I think, a, a, purely physical world um, in people's true lives, in their hearts, um, falls far short for what they yearn for in terms of understanding and interpersonal relations. Um, and so acknowledged or not, I think um, things that are outside of the, the strict sciences are a reality of our lives and probably pay, uh, play a larger role in our lives than do the physical sciences, other than we're contained by gravity and we have to obey physical laws um, in our bodies. Um, so I find no contradiction, as a matter of fact, I find a lot of synergy and a lot of understanding in that. Um, you know, thoughts differ, but um, I think there's a, a large um, percentage of, of folks who feel that. Yeah, yep. I, uh, no, I think that's a wonderful point. Um, you know, I heard somebody once describe love as a chemical imbalance, you know. Hmm. Um, well, we're sometimes much from a more science, than that, but you know, um, we're forced to come up with those right. kinds of scientific um, explanations that don't quite hit the mark. I think. Right. Um, so, when did you? How long did it take you to write the book? When did you start writing the book? So, I um, was a, well. My daughter and I made a, a trip to Ireland in 2012, in the spring of 2012. Um, and I didn't have a novel in mind at the time, but I soaked up the atmosphere um, of just the enchantment, the beauty, the nature, the culture. Uh, but then even more than that, I found it uh, really remarkable how pervasive um, and integral to that culture the early monastic um, lives were. Uh, and it's all throughout Ireland. And so being a person of Catholic background, there was that natural interest in that, but it is just so uh, integral to um, Irish thought and belief that um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, so that you know, stuck with me and, and it was pretty impressive. Um, now the specific idea for this book um, came to me in the fall, it was about six months later, and the setting just made perfect sense. Having just come back from Ireland months before um, and seeing the history there and knowing a little bit about the saints that um, lived there and the monks, etc. Uh, so it was the perfect setting and it all came together. Good, yeah. I, uh, I know what you mean. I, I, even when I wrote my first book, 
I had had a setting in mind, and the, the, but it was just one epiphany. Mm. One day, just one thought, you know, mm. said, wow, I could build it around this, and I did. Um, so, now, one thing I wanted to talk to you about or ask you about was when you were writing the book, you took a trip to the Holy Land. Yeah, so um, a couple things. One is um, the, the story is structured in three parts within this volume. Um, and the first and third parts are primarily set in Ireland, um, some in Dublin and much of it on the western side of, of Ireland, the Atlantic coast of Ireland. Uh, but then also the middle third of it takes place in Rome and primarily the Vatican. And I've spent quite a bit of time there. Uh, but then also during the writing of this, um, a small group of us, about 15, made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, so to Jerusalem, uh, Galilee, etc. Um, and so some of that was very real um, because although this story is primarily taking place in the contemporary world, so starting in 2010, Ireland, and then Italy, um, there's also an historical journey that takes place uh, going back to the New Testament times, making its way through um, the Roman Empire and the fall of the Roman Empire and then um, heading up to uh, medieval Ireland. And so having been in Jerusalem uh, really uh, was able to, I was able to portray real locations right. uh, there right. and have a real sense for what that was like, in addition to having walked the places where, where this happened. My wife and I just made as part of a book tour, uh, we spent uh, 12 days in Ireland and got to some of the places oh, nice. that I included in the book that I had not physically been to, and so that was really quite wow, special. Oh, that must be fun, yeah. It is. Yeah, that is a, um, uh, like most of my uh, my stories revolve around Gillette's Castle up and, and stuff, and uh, it is incredible the feeling you get when you walk mm -hmm. around, you know, especially when you've spun a story. Mine's total fiction, but, you know, when you spin a story around a certain mm -hmm. area and then to actually see it and be there and go, wow, you know, this happened here yeah. at what time, or, you know, whether it was way in the past or 100 years ago or whenever. Mm -hmm. It was uh, um, pretty incredible. Um, so tell me a little bit about your book. Okay. Or tell me a lot about your book. Uh, I'll be glad to. You know, so um, it's called Celtic Crossing. It came out in September of this year. Um, and again, uh, it's a contemporary novel. The, the main story is a contemporary novel that starts in 2010, ends in 2010. Um, and it's about a woman, her name is Aideen Callahan. Uh, she's a grandmother, and her 10-year-old grandson has leukemia. It originally uh, responded to therapy, but then recurred, and so uh, now it's you know, life-threatening for him. Um, but they are the last of a long Irish lineage that's been plagued by cancers. So in fact, Aideen's uh, grandmother died of cancer, her father died of cancer, and her daughter Michael's mother died of cancer, so she's been raising the child. Um, but if you go back to her great-grandmother, Aideen's great-grandmother, um, that um, grandmother had developed cancer when she was a teenager, and she was cured by touching a holy relic that dated back to Golgotha, uh, so New Testament times. Uh, and it was known in Ireland, because uh, that's where it physically ended up, as the curing cross of St. Patrick. St. Patrick um, was actually one of the protectors of this, this relic over time. Um, and so Aideen knows that her great-grandmother was cured by touching this relic, as were previous generations uh, before the great-grandmother. Uh, and so when her grandson now is dying, she says, you know, we just need to find this relic in time to save Michael. Uh, and she has no idea where it went. Um, her understanding was that in 1866, her great-grandmother was cured, and shortly after that, the relic just disappeared. So uh, she's aware that there's a Boston College Jesuit researcher who's on sabbatical in Dublin for a year. She reads about him in the newspaper, and she contacts him and says, I need your help. And so then he's set off on a quest uh, to try to find this, and so that takes them here, there, and, and, oh, wow. and uh, Italy. Um, and then there's a young seminarian who's um, kind of at a crossroads in his life um, in seminary. So he links up with this um, priest who's 48, and uh, together they, um, they go on their quest to try to find this relic. Nice. So the, that's where the story begins. Okay. And 
the story is, it takes primarily takes place in Ireland. Yeah, it's rooted in Ireland. Okay. That's where the family is. Yes, and then um, in as part of their investigation as to where this might have gone, the trail leads to Rome and the okay. Vatican and the secret archives and All right. deep in the Vatican. Yep. But um, it's, it's not quite as um, trendy in terms of its the structure and, and the plot as as it sounds, but um, so much of church history and, and all of these and relics have to do with Rome, of course, because right. it's the, the seat of the, the Catholic Church. So yeah. it naturally takes them there. So of what I understand, I was talking earlier, you were planning on writing two more books. Yeah, so the, the story um, has a trajectory. Um, and so this is a self-contained book as first stories of a trilogy uh, really need to be, especially for a, a, a novice author. Um, and so it's self-contained and, and one can read this book and feel satisfied that the story comes to a close. But um, in the hearts of authors, these characters are very real and of course they have lives beyond the story itself. Um, and so there's, there are hints at, in the final closing of the book um, of the next step and so many of these characters are going to be continuing on and we're going to be learning more about them. So um, books two and three are well in the planning stages and, and I've been uh, starting to write the second book. Good, good. Sit down and plug away? The plug away and, uh, a, and enjoy. It, it yeah. is such a pleasure to write actually. Yeah, I, I, it's uh, uh, people uh, People always ask me, you know, where do you find the time? Where? But it, to me it's not really a, a chore so much as a um, yeah. It's a love. I, you mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's something I like to do, um, and it's important, you mm -hmm. know, to, to do that. Um, so what else was now? Oh, you know, that was a, kind of an interesting point. So, do you believe in miracles? Um, I do, and I think it's um, helpful to think about what a miracle means and and what its roles are and what people's expectations are for miracles. Um, so I, th I think of miracles as being um, events that happen that pretty much defy physical laws that we bodily live under um, control of in, in this world. Um, but if you think about the transcendent, the transcendent um, is outside of physical laws by definition and by nature. And so breaking in of God's grace into this world, either by direct activity or through, I think much more commonly, through the activity um, and efforts of, of those who are given talents um, and roles in this world, miracles happen. And so um, whether in medical case, whether they're through the interventions of a healthcare team that leads to cures or improvements in health uh, or through the development of new drugs, um, all of those can rightly be considered miracles, um, even through hard physical work of, of doing this. Um, but uh, many would feel there's a hand of God in those types of um, human achievements as well. And do you, um, do you think it's important to have faith in your medicine and when, you're, when people are dealing I with I think uh, so, these? yeah, and I think there's a, a we're increasingly understanding that um, the, the mind and optimism, um, other uh, issues such as marriage, um, support, community support, religion, um, even if it's solely based on um, psychologic uh, impact and uh, the, the positive effects on uh, the body's um, hormones and immune responsiveness and power and strength and endurance, all of those have impact. So the body-mind connection is very real. Um, if you extend that to um, body-mind-spirit, um, it can be equally or more powerful. No, that's, that is, that's very inspiring. I, 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 I agree with you to that. I believe that uh, I believe the mind can do much much more than we know. Yeah. You know uh, well, and, it is. And you know? When you look at it in the opposite, it's a little bit easier to, to comprehend. Um, if you have people who are dejected and they give up, 
we all know that that's not right. good for recovery. So in the opposite sense, if you have a sense of positivism and uh, support, all of that I think helps play a role in how one responds to therapy and how successful that might be. Uh, I don't want to overstate the, you know, the, um, the, the positive impact of that, but it certainly does right. have um, a role. And when we look at the immune therapies that are uh, quite successful these days, as we know, um, a lot of those are successful in boosting the body's own immunity, triggering the body to work harder against the cancer on its own. And so those connections do exist. Good. Well, um, I think that it's a, I, I love the story. Uh, I can't wait to read the book. Um, so where, where, are the, where is the book available? So it's uh, broadly available on Amazon, um, Barnes & Noble, BAM, et cetera. Um, also in local bookstores, independent bookstores, readily available. Uh, Ingram is a strong distribution mechanism, so um, if your local bookstore doesn't have it, it's available. Uh, certainly in the region here, right. uh, it's, it's stocked. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, do you have any events coming up? or? Um, we are planning one, hopefully in and around. Uh, St. Patrick um, is one of the historical characters who is in the book. Uh, St. Brendan the Navigator as well. Um, St. Menin, uh, St. Bridget. So um, a natural uh, time to have an event would be in and around St. Patrick's Day. So we're working on something there. So oh, good. we'll have that posted and hopefully that will be exciting and, and yeah. uh, well received. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think it should be well received any time of the year. But that's yeah. a. Um, and you are, like I said, you are on Amazon and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I just want people to know where they can, you know, go and grab this book. Yeah, so um, I think the website is, is um, visible at the bottom of the screen um, off and on during this broadcast. But yep. if you go to the website, you can easily find where it's available. Okay. But it shouldn't be difficult to find. Yeah. <laughs> and um, how do you like uh, Mystic? You've been here, what, 10 years now? Love Mystic. Right. Yeah, so I, I mentioned that we lived in Michigan for 50 years. Uh, but some of that time we liked to vacation in the Upper Peninsula and we found that Maine has a lot of reminiscences there. So we have vacation in Maine for over 40 years and we have a, a summer cabin up there now. So we get up there. But Mystic is wonderful. Yeah. Gotta yeah. love it. I, I love I it myself. Um, well, we're getting toward the end of the show. Um, there's just a couple of things I'd like to uh, mention before we go. Both me and Len belong to the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, um, which is a wonderful group for writers, uh, publishers, uh, illustrators, editors. Um, we encourage everybody who has anything to do with the written word to uh, come to our meetings, to uh, be part of our group. Um, you can find a lot of support, uh, a lot of help, a lot of uh, things that you didn't realize as Besides writing a book, the publishing of a book, and distributing a book, and there's a lot more to it. But there's, you can get a lot of help. We meet every third Monday at the Groton Regency at 6:30. Now, um, it's a great group of knuckleheads, and uh, we really do encourage people uh, to come by. Um, we're easygoing, unjudgmental. If you haven't written a book, or you haven't written a book yet, um, you know, come by and uh, see what we're all about. Um, the other thing I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, I talked about a lot this holiday season was uh, shopping small, supporting our local community, supporting our local businesses. And I also started a little campaign called Watch Small. Uh, you know, everybody's, uh, of course, you know, television today is huge. And there's, uh, you know, the media, multimedia out there. But uh, it's the small stations like this station, uh, SEC TV, that gives us people a voice it gives us a chance to understand each other to know each other to learn about each other um, and I think that you should take an hour or two a week turn on your local public access channel uh, channel 12 for Comcast uh, this it you can find it on your cable stations and see what's going on around town see what's going on with uh, the people that you see every day um, you might be surprised. Um, you can meet more people like Lynn Mateo here, who, uh, Matano, who uh, 
you know, written a book and is doing wonderful work. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll all tune in once in a while and uh, check us out. Um, thank you very much. It's been Books and Beyond this week, and we'll see you next time.